Okay, it's uh, 7 o'clock. I'd like to open up a joint public hearing with City Council Ordinance Committee uh, on three proposed ordinances. Um, we're going to open and discuss two on traffic uh, mitigation and uh, parking uh, issues, two ordinances at the same time. There's one on Lathrop on zoning uh, map change. We'll, we'll hold on that and we'll discuss that uh, second. So Carolyn's going to walk us through and then we'll discuss and these first two I think should be pretty straightforward but Carolyn okay so um, there's two uh, amendments um, actually sponsored and on the recommendation of Councillor Owen Freeman Daniels uh, related to uh, traffic mitigation and uh, um, essentially um, logistics of how the um, um, how it functions internally not necessarily you know big um, swooping changes so there's some um, minor text changes the first one is to the site plan approval section which this ordinance was referred to planning board uh, initially um, because it is a zoning ordinance item the other item um, which you don't um, typically necessarily look at is another section of the ordinance not in the zoning code um, but council referred it um, to the planning board because it related to um, uh, powers and duties of um, essentially issuing or addressing the mitigation um, distribution um, under parking and transportation. So under 11.6, the site plan criteria is the approval criteria uh, that relates to traffic mitigation. And um, in subsection B2, the amend proposed amendment um, would add a sentence that would further specify that all expenditures of in-lieu payments will be done by the mayor with approval of city council only after first being introduced for recommendation to the Transportation and Parking Commission. Um, so it's just that one sentence that's added to that big paragraph in your approval criteria. Um, regarding traffic mitigation. Um, one, from a staff level, um, we would recommend that an additional phrase be added at the end of that sentence to make it really long um, that just um, clarifies that expenditures of in-lieu payments would be done you know, with the approval of city council, et cetera, as long as it's consistent with any planning board conditions that um, you all might place on a permit just to clarify that they that parking and transportation or city council wouldn't be overriding any kind of planning board condition once it leaves the planning board um, the other item is in section uh, chapter uh, 22 section 119 which is uh, relates to Northampton transportation and parking commission powers and duties um, uh, section B2F would state providing recommendations for using the funds that are a result of payments made pursuant to 350 11.6 as conditions of any granted special permit or granted site plan review by the Planning Board or Zoning Board of Appeals the Office of Planning and Development may act as staff to the Commission in performing this responsibility so just further clarifying the the administration of the funds The first one, 350-11.6, can you read what the proposed language is again? The proposed language would be, so there's a long paragraph <laughs> that talks about um, what thresholds need to be met um, and how you would mitigate any increased traffic um, impacts. And then in that middle paragraph, there's a sentence to be added. That, so there's a state there's a sentence that says currently um, if the impacts are not mitigated the planning board shall require in lieu payments to fund a project's proportional share of necessary improvements to mitigate off-site traffic impacts including provisions of public transit and pedestrian or bicycle paths in lieu of requiring off-site improvements with such payments as set forth in the table below and then a new sentence would be added is proposed to be added as follows all expenditures of in-lieu payments will be done 
by the mayor with the approval of city council only after first being introduced for recommendation to the transportation and parking commission and then I would recommend adding consistent with planning board conditions um, so it's really so this is only relates to um, applicants who instead of actually doing work um, to mitigate traffic um, opt to p make a payment in lieu of that actual mitigation so it really is specific to those folks who um, offer money for the city to do the work what's the the genesis of this of the need for this word um, I was think there it was, um, Councilor Freeman Daniels or Wayne might be able to speak to that I think there was, had been some conversation at the parking and transportation level so I wasn't part of those conversations so I'm not exactly sure was there conf yeah, go ahead. evening thank you uh, really the uh, main element was to try to bring the city the two really two real parts of it one is try to bring the city uh, into conformance with state law which um, the understanding now of the state law is that uh, all gifts made to the city must be can only be expended uh, once approved by the city council and with and by the mayor, uh, so that has to happen anyway. Doesn't have to be in the zoning because it's state law. Um, but uh, the other part was uh, really to try to put to try to uh, put in writing some good process. Uh, I felt that the transportation parking commission, after the planning board states its conditions, which I think is a very f a good addition. Um, what uh, Ms. Mish is talking about after the um, planning board states its conditions and the, the um, money is, is uh, has been paid uh, to use the Transportation Parking Commission which is a, a interdisciplinary body um, you know it's it's a uh, quite a quite a, a large group and it has um, a lot of different perspectives to try to use that body in uh, figuring out what kinds of projects uh, that money would be spent on um, so so the council has to see it and actually the council could simply just as a practice refer it to transportation parking every time or not every time if the council feels so inclined I, I was really just trying to put in writing some good policy some good practice and that that's really the the order as I see it this is sort of the practice we've been doing already right um, everything goes transportation parking I think in the past Sometimes they, they voted and sometimes they just nodded their head. The main change is to require them to form a vote, which is fine. So there wasn't any confusion over how things were operating. It just, this is just makes it more formal and, okay. Yep. Um, I'm the planning board person who's on transportation parking. And I don't think we're trying to fix any problem here. It's been working just great. So um, I think the projects that have, have been managed through planning have been done well. The mayor gets involved in deciding when to do it. I don't, I'm just like to say, I don't think we're fixing a problem okay. if that's what you're wondering about. Right. Okay. Just make one of the suggested changes uh, for the, the non zoning ordinance, the 22 119. Mm -hmm. um, it might be worth providing recommendation for using traffic mitigation funds. At this point, I don't think you've ever required other funds, but theoretically, it could be something else comes up at some point. Right. Mm -hmm. So for the council, but we can say that transition plus. Uh, so Wayne, uh, is, I think in depth, you guys said this is the way it works today. So the couple things that usually come up with the, the I mean, Councilor Daniels referred to them as gifts. Uh, I'm not sure if we always consider these things as gifts to the city, these payments in lieu. Um, so that's where this has been a gray area. They're, they're not gifts, which require council approval. Mm -hmm. They're also not grants, which do not require council approval. And the citizens are saying, well, they're closer to that we should treat them, we should go to council for their approval. Right. So today you don't have to go to council to spend the money? The previous city solicitor thought we didn't need to. The current city solicitor thinks we do. I think the current one's correct. Mm -hmm. And then, so uh, the, 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 the question I have is, so for example, we just did Opal. And when we approved Opal, I think we had, it was like $103,000 for traffic mitigation money. And typically when we approve a project, that money has to be used somewhere within the vicinity, vicinity of the project itself so the opal money can't be used up in Leeds. that's correct and right. can't be used on king street so my my concern and is, is that do we have to 
somehow make that an issue. I mean, when it goes to city council and somebody sees there's $103,000 that the council might be considering a gift to the city, is there a way to make sure that that money is only being used for traffic mitigation in the neighborhood of the site that gave us the money? Right, yeah. So, so I guess a couple, there's maybe three answers to that. One is you all have the right to do whatever reasonable conditions you want on a project. Right. So, if, you know, in Leeds, for example, there's a project that came up and you said specifically this needs to be used and you defined where it should be used. So you have the right to do that. The second answer is, yes, that's only part of what staff's job is, is to make sure the money gets spent legally. It has to get used and, you know, where, where there's that strong nexus. Right. So I, I think we're safe there. I, I think where you would certainly always get a debate is there has to be a nexus that shows that the project, the developer is gaining from the use. But we could all draw our lines somewhat differently. So using Leeds as an example, you could certainly say, well, it's Grove and Evergreen. But someone could say, well, a lot of traffic is going down Florence Street. Mm -hmm. um, and someone might make a rational argument for doing this. So I think it may be one of the things the planning board wants to talk about during permits. If you well, that's what I wanted. Do we have to be more specific than when we do a permit? For example, again, the Opal money, if it looks like there's $103,000 that the city council now has to prove the use of, and well, maybe we should use it to offset the DPW costs for no. water. I mean, how do we make sure that the money is used for what the planning board intended it to be used I for? I think you're fine for that. I think the law wouldn't allow it to be used elsewhere. It's exactly where's the impact. So it couldn't be used for DPW. It couldn't be used for police cars. It couldn't be used for <coughs> leads. So all those things I think you're safe on. It could be used for either State Street or Elm Street because those are legitimate pieces. And if you felt strongly that the impact that in your, you know, based on the information you hear, it really doesn't need to be needed in, in, on State Street, then yes, that would make sense. Well, I guess because a lot of the time, the payment is something that the applicant for the project is offering to ameliorate the impact of the project on that neighborhood, right. on that street, on the adjoining streets. So um, I'm not sure if we have to be very explicit then in our conditions that says, you know, the payment in lieu of uh, or the traffic mitigation money has to be used. I mean, do we have to get into this idea that has to be within, used within a six-block area? I mean, for example, Opal, we didn't get to specifics. In yeah. fact, and we, we had a lot of discussion about that last week. We, we, we said that that money is going to be, there's going to be discussion with the neighbors, there's going to be discussion uh, with the developer. There might be part of it used during the initial build. There might be part of it used over time. I just don't know how, how specific we have to get then to make sure that the, the money is used in the way that the planning board and the, and the, the applicant intended it to be used. So, so I think the overall piece is it, it can't legally be used for something that doesn't benefit the project. So it, if you don't have any specific feelings, you don't need to be clear in the permit, we'll make sure that gets used legally. But if, based on your testimony, your testimony you hear, you say you really want it to be used in this exact way, then that's when you need to be specific. Right, and sometimes projects are very specific. We're very specific what the traffic mitigation should be used for, and other times we're, we're, we're not. But the understanding is it has to be used in a certain way. So. Um, that's just my concern is that by by adding the, the, the wording at the end something to the effect co consistent with planning board conditions does that more or less cover us with what you're saying to it's not specific but it's 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 specific enough that it says yeah I guess I mean you know all due respect to the City Council but once things go before the City Council it becomes a very different issue as to when it's before the planning board and it becomes a very political issue that can be become a very different issue when you guys all talk about it than when we all talk about it. So that's my concern is we're, we're usually very specific and our intentions are very clear what we want that money to be used for. Yeah. Well, I think, again, if you tie it, the money has to be tied to the project. And if you set conditions or, or lead us in the direction of where you want to spend the money and transportation parking is added to the process and they concur with you I can't see where the council is going to go off and say we want to do, do something totally different since you have the <coughs> the expertise in this area you're actually dealing with with a permanent you're you're dealing with the neighbors and you're dealing with what makes it all work I just I can only speak for myself but I can't see us deciding to basically almost re-permit it on our end and decide to change what you want to do. See, I don't think you have the authority to do that. I think it's almost you're creating a double veto system. Planning board has to be satisfied. That protects you, but council has to be satisfied as well. Cause, and, cause, I, yeah. and I think we're more or less there just because 
the, the law requires us to be there. But I, we have enough stuff. To, we, have, we have enough stuff to get political over without messing around with your permits. For the most part, I would think, for myself. I was just going to state it. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, uh, that's why I was um, interested in Marilyn's suggestion that we have the consistent with planning board. Can you say that again? Con consistent with conditions. Conditions. planning board yeah. conditions. That was that would that was because I had that mm -hmm. same concern that you did, Stephen. So I would be much more comfortable um, having that amendment come before us at ordinance, and moving that forward. I mean that that's your choice, and then we'll we'll make mm -hmm. our deliberation. But I would welcome that kind of addition to the end of the ordinance or that amendment, that suggested amendment. It almost seems like if. It, if if it leaves planning board with the wording consistent with planning board conditions and then it before it gets to council it goes through transportation and parking that if if at that time there's a need for whatever reason to be specific that's that's where it could get specific is in at that stage so then when it gets to council but I, I don't really see it needing ever with that wording it seems to cover us yep. Thanks. I just want to point out one more thing um, that uh, I, I think that this is a valid concern because the council could, against the the advice of the law of its lawyers and so on, indeed vote on some illegal, uh, you know, something contrary to a permit. It could do that. Um, I actually think putting the referring it uh, requiring the council to refer it to transportation parking is actually a step in the right direction here. Uh, so I think that concern would support this language because um, we know it has to go to council anyway. Putting it to transportation parking, um, sometimes to my chagrin, uh, the council voters are outnumbered by the uh, on the other <laughs> on transportation. <laughs> so, uh, so I said it's an interdisciplinary body, many different perspectives, and the the councilors, the the elected uh, uh, individuals who sit on that commission uh, don't aren't, aren't the majority. So uh, I think uh, staff would still have a lot of influence uh, on that, uh, and. Um, so I think that, yeah, it's, it's in fact a concern, but I think actually this language would probably even make it better. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Anyone from the public that has a desire to speak about this? No? So we can close public comment and then we can we make a recommendation. We can vote on the recommendation to the council. And we can bundle these two together. They seem to go together. Independent of, yep, there. And just so you know, what we're going to do with both these public hearings is we're going to close our public hearings tonight along with you, but we're going to deliberate and make our decision at our meeting on the 19th. Okay. We typically do that separately. Yeah. So when we do that, we will see your language right. before we actually meet on it. Right. So if there, if there are changes that need to be made, we can okay. incorporate them at that point. Okay. I move close the public hearing. Second. Second. All in favor. <coughs> mm -hmm. Likewise. I move to close this public hearing. Second. All in favor. Aye. Good. Thank you. Any discussion? No. <coughs> How about a motion? I move okay. that we recommend to the city. We recommend the city council or ordinance. City council. City council. City council. Okay. I move that we recommend to the city council changes uh, the amendments to zoning ordinance 350-11.6 uh, approval criteria and procedures for dispensing traffic mitigation funds with the amendments uh, as Carolyn has read them, and the amendment to ordinance 22-19 Northampton Transportation and Parking Commission powers and duties. I don't believe you had any changes to it. There was one yeah. additional, um, uh, just clarifying that using traffic mitigation funds that are a result of payments. Right. Okay, as, as amended, as Second. suggested. Right. Okay. Second. All in favor? Okay. That closes that. You're going to keep yours open. No, we closed I our mean, public closed hearing, but we'll have our discussion so, and deliberation, okay. and we will see your changes. Right. And, and we can incorporate that when we deal with it. Okay. 
So next up, we have one more ordinance on a uh, proposed uh, map, zoning map change at Lathrop. Uh, do you want to walk us through that one, Carolyn? Yeah. Um, and I have just for reference. So this is a essentially this is a map change, a zoning uh, amendment to the zoning district for a parcel of land, and it was. Um, Essentially, what we refer to as a citizen petition, it wasn't introduced by a counselor um, or any department. So let's see, one, two, three, four. And this is just a map for reference here. Okay. Do, you want, um, do you want us to share? Can I? Um, so there is a small uh, parcel. Um, this is uh, Lathrop um, Communities has a parcel, as you all may know, on Bridge Road, on the north side of Bridge Road. Uh, and they recently purchased a property that, for the most part, abuts um, their property for the back 80% of their lot going all the way back. It's a very deep lot. There is one intervening parcel at the street frontage between Lathrop and this and this parcel that they purchased, but um, Lathrop, the Lathrop parcel in and of itself is zoned urban residential B. The surrounding lots on that side of Bridge Road are zoned um, rural residential. Um, so what they are asking is to rezone this parcel that they recently bought that abuts their. Um, broader parcel uh, to l allow future options for them to uh, potentially expand. Uh, they've sent a letter uh, to the city uh, in furtherance of this request asking, uh, I'll read the letters from um, the executive director of Lathrop. I'm writing to confirm that Lathrop Community Inc. has agreed not to develop the property at 716 Bridge Road with a curb cut onto Bridge Road as a condition of the city's inclusion of that property in the URB zoning district. This condition would apply to any transferee or assign assignee in the Lathrop Community Inc. for so long as the abutting properties are not also rezoned in the URB district. Um, Lathrop does not have immediate plans for 716 Bridge Road, but our plans are to expand the Northampton community if the property is included in the URB district. Those plans would provide for access to any new units through the existing Lathrop entrance on Bridge Road. So this letter is a result of a request by staff to suggest that on a staff level we could support the rezoning if there were an, a, a development agreement with um, Lathrop that they not build a new access way and the reason is that um, Bridge Road in that area is um, has many traffic congestion and turning movement issues and adding another egress onto Bridge Road without correcting the existing conditions where the nursing home is and where the other part of Hatfield Street comes in from the south um, would make a bad situation potentially much worse. So we and, and they were agreeable to it, so they've written this letter. It's not a full development agreement, and typically the city council, um, when we've, we've actually entered into some of these agreements pre on other um, instances where applicants want to have their properties rezoned and their issues related, technical issues related to the property, and we've entered into development agreements with um, applicants and had the actual development agreement signed by the applicant before city council actually takes the vote. So they've sort of taken one step in that direction, but um, they haven't actually given us language, the actual recordable development agreement language yet. Um, so I think because the existing Lathrop community is, is urban residential B, I don't think on a, it, I think conceptually from, uh, it makes sense to add this additional parcel in to the URB zone so long as that development agreement is in place before the council votes. If I could just add to that, this has been consistent for about a decade now. We've talked about that whole area north of Bridge Road, basically from Lathrop all the way to Cook Avenue, 
and that section along Hatfield Road is all being appropriate to be rezoned URB, but only when the traffic issues on Bridge Road are resolved. Some of you have been on the board forever may remember we approved a project at 408 Bridge that never got built, and it was going to include traffic mitigation. It was going to include a, tra a detailed traffic study. But what is the future solution for Bridge Road? nursing homes talked to us about rezoning that property and that was the same issue we had with them the former nursing home with them is it shouldn't get rezoned some with more traffic until we deal with, with the intersection issues so we could move this forward or recommend it based on the condition that a development agreement is in place <coughs> before vote. Okay. questions I'm oh, sorry. Could later subdivide? Could, could they cut that lot up? Um, no, they originally got a permit. Their permit was for, um, I think if I remember correctly, I pulled up their original special permit for the existing, was under a special permit, and um, uh, a special permit for townhouses. So this is developed under a scenario that they don't have enough frontage to, to subdivide. Mm -hmm. There's an existing. I believe it's just a single family home on this parcel that they purchased. Um, so, you know, that could continue as is, but under rural residential, they couldn't add any more townhouse units to that parcel uh, because the zoning doesn't allow it based on the configuration. So, once it's rezoned, then they could add, essentially amend their original special permit by adding townhouse units that spill over into this parcel at some location, but they couldn't create a subdivision out of it. Yeah. In Lathrop, the driveway is not a road. No, I was just, just wondering, because doesn't, isn't access. if you own two adjoining parcels, they effectively become a single parcel? They do, but it doesn't change the zoning. So you could have split zone, we have split right. zone parcels, you know, frequently. In the oh, city. the church. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> not anymore, you guys correct me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the city council did. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yes, there are split zone parcels. Questions from the board, anybody? Questions from the public? Yeah, yes, you could come up and just state your name and address. Uh, Kim Quinlan, and I actually am on that intervening parcel <coughs> that Lathrop surrounds. Um, and our concerns in this rezoning are both the um, traffic concerns about the bridge road, and I understand that they're not planning to put another entrance off the bridge road, but as the neighbors, we are concerned about that, so we just like to echo that concern. Um, in addition to that, our concern is how much they're planning to build and, and how um, big the pieces are, the uh, units are that they're planning to build, and how many, um, because we are completely surrounded by them. So we're a little concerned. Uh, the back end of that property is a dingle, and so I'm not really sure exactly how far back they could build, because it doesn't look big, uh, buildable in the very back. So those are our concerns moving forward with that. I can't. <laughs> Which house is yours? 712. We're the one that they surround. We're right next to 716, which is the par parcel oh, that they just purchased. Let's be, let's so it's right here. Yeah, absolutely. That one? Yep. Okay. Yep. Right. So if this were approved and they wanted to do some work in the future, it would be an amendment to a special permit that have to come back to us anyway right so if there's any issue at that time for whatever reason we could address it then this right. is just to make it more consistent from a zoning standpoint right and again they don't they've as they stated in their letter they don't have specific plans right. yet but they bought it with the option of you know potentially doing that but yes they know full well that they'd be coming back to the planning board for Thank Kim you. how are they as neighbor as neighbors now um, <laughs> they're, they're fine as neighbors. They are um, sprinklers, uh, but they have a well, so I think that that's all right. Um, and they have really big lawnmowers that make a ton of noise. But aside from that, they're actually fine neighbors. I also know that there's a number of empty units in there, so what they're building and what <coughs> is a little concerning. I understand that they would have to come back before they make building requests. But, um, but aside from that, they're, they're fine neighbors. It does, you know, the traffic on that road, a lot of people pulling in and out of there are moving slowly, and so it does create some additional traffic right. congestion right at that 
intersection. Um, and as well, there is a crosswalk there, but it's really not a very, um, what is the word that I want to use? The cars don't necessarily respect that crosswalk, so that it creates a big problem when residents are trying to cross <laughs> across that crosswalk. So. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening. <laughs> Um, Marilyn Richards, uh, 20 Bridge Road, Unit 8. And um, I'm here tonight in my capacity as the uh, chair of the uh, uh, Board of the Lathrop Communities. So I just want to sort of re reiterate some things that have been said and um, <clears throat> also to an answer any questions that you might have. Um, first of all, uh, Lathrop Communities does not have any current plans to, to build. But um, as the parcel um, came up, um, it just seemed prudent to us, knowing the, the baby boomer uh, tsunami in the future, that more in energy efficient homes for people uh, 55 and, and much actually much older um, will be uh, will be needed. Um, uh, our plans are to integrate whatever is built into the current uh, Lathrop community on Bridge Road uh, using the, the current entrance to the Lathrop community. And uh, visually, it would look very similar to um, and fit in with the places that exist there right now. Uh, when we do have, uh, when and if we do have plans to build, and there are some vacant units there right now due to the economy, um, uh, we will uh, first work with the neighbors and let the neighbors in on our plans. So um, you can rest assured that we will do that and, and do anything that we can to be good neighbors and solve any uh, traffic problems that are there. But the intent is to use the current entrance and we're happy to enter into the um, uh, 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 agreement uh, for the planning board. So um, uh, do, does anybody else have any questions? I have a question maybe of you, Wayne. Could, um, I mean, is there any limit? I mean, could they build as many and still just use the one? I mean, is that their choice or is there a limit at which from a safety or fire or anything like where at some point that we would say, or the city would say from a zoning standpoint, you gotta have more than one entrance? Um, yes, there's a limit, but there's no number for it. It's basically when the fire chief says he's so concerned about what it is. Usually as a rule of thumb, we don't like only one curb cut coming to a site. Lathrop, when this was first permitted 15 years ago, whenever it was, the reason it's a very wide boulevard, one of the arguments against a single curb cut is unlikely, but a tree falls and there's a big fire. And so the whole reason they did the wide boulevard there was to reduce that chance. It's so wide you have greater access. And so I wouldn't, I don't know what that number is, but I wouldn't think this parcel would put you over it. And we would, you know, come to planning board with our, with our plans for any new um, units there when we decide to do that. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Marilyn. Yep, in the back. <coughs> Real character. Sustic. Yes, uh, Steve Susco, 754 Bridge Road. Uh, I would like to make an extensive presentation to the board and the commission or the uh, committee, uh, but I haven't had the opportunity to do that yet because I only found out about this rezoning on Tuesday. So I'm hoping you'll be able to give me that opportunity. Uh, first of all, I'd like to speak for another neighbor who asked me to and to request in the strongest possible terms uh, and this is uh, for Mr. Richard Jasky who is at 774 Bridge Road and has a uh, has been affected by uh, significantly affected in the past by a significant aspect of this related to this proposal that being the drainage situation uh, he's ill this evening he's unable to attend he requests the hearing to be continued to allow him to give direct comment regarding uh, the, his thoughts on this proposal. So I'm making that request for him. And as I said, I'm also requesting that the hearing be continued so I can develop my presentation to a degree that uh, it deserves. Uh, 
I'm opposed to this rezoning. And the reason is, is I'm not opposed to the Lathrop community. Uh, what I'm opposed to is that uh, changing the zoning will do one thing of great significance. It will exacerbate the existing drainage problem, which was caused by the development of the Lathrop community to a degree which I think should uh, uh, preclude the uh, rezoning at this time until that situation is addressed. And just to give you a flavor, I, I have a lot more information. And I have my original pleas to the planning board and office uh, from 20 years ago now regarding the drainage situation, which was ignored. And th this, this is the type of result, if I could pass these around, and I'd like them back, please. These were taken in the last year. That's the result of the poor drainage situation. And this proposal will only add to that. <clears throat> as far as uh, matching the zoning, I don't see where we need to match the zoning. Uh, the zoning has been that zoning since the beginning of the zoning ordinance. Uh, the zoning in that area has basically been SR and RR. And uh, persons such as myself and uh, Mr. Jasky and Mr. Cotton, who I hope will follow me here, uh, have lived with that zoning for more than 50 years. And we've had no complaints about it. And uh, I think, uh, and I do know, obviously, the, the development of the original development of the Lathrop community required a rezoning. Uh, which I think was spot zoning at the time, and I still do, and I think this only adds to the spot zoning. Uh, I also, as part of the presentation I would like to give, and I'm not prepared to, is that some 10 years ago, I requested a rezoning of my property and uh, in order to build more affordable housing that I can under the existing zoning, which is SR. And uh, that proposal that I made, I have, uh, let me see if I can find my characterization here. Uh, it was trounced by both the planning board and the planning office and the city solicitor. I was referred to as a, a zoning criminal uh, and nothing has changed from that day until this day. So if my zoning proposal to allow a few more units to make it more affordable was of a criminal nature, it was spot zoning, then this is the same. I don't see the difference. And it's not right. Uh, I don't believe the world revolves around the Lathrop community. I think this area is bigger than the Lathrop community, and I ask you to think of it that way. Uh, just, uh, just for your, for what it's worth, the f former owner I knew, the Thorntons. Uh, recently passed on. Barbara Thornton, the owner of the land who originally opposed uh, the, the development proposals before the Lathrop community. The last time I spoke with her, and, and this is years, would never have wanted her land to become part of this development. But obviously it's sold and it is. Uh, the land as it exists now and has for the last 50 or 70 years is an offer to a long-term viable local business, the Cotton Tree Service. And uh, with, uh, with any, whatever intentions, I, I don't like to characterize people in the Lathrop community any different than anybody else, but 
if they develop that up to the uh, border with the cotton property, there's going to be complaints, noise, visual complaints. Uh, how, are, how is that going to be dealt with? Are we going to let it happen and then somehow Mr. Cotton suffers for it? I don't believe that's correct. I think we should address all these situations pre-development. The sewer capacity, is it, do we have it? Uh, we, as you know, as you may know, there's been sewer problems in the area. The, the source of the grease buildup in the sewer is unknown. Could, could it be the Lathrop community? Could be. No one knows. I don't know. Uh, I think uh, concentrating and, 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 to, and to increase the concentration and, and the size of the, of the over concentration undermines and takes away uh, from the area. It also undermines uh, the whole concept of zoning, in my opinion. It's ought to be something you can rely on. As I said, we've lived under these restrictions for 50 to 70 years. And it limits what we can do with our property. And I also uh, heard Mr. Fiden just tonight say that the intent is to rezone the area between the Lathrop community and Cook Avenue uh, to all to URB. Does that mean I'm going to be an SR island? This isn't co correct. After you turn down my proposal for rezoning, no, I think what I'm saying is... I it's think unfair. It's just patently unfair. I think what I'm saying and is... If you can't see that, uh, I don't know what I can do about it. Uh, I'm wondering if the notices on this situation are correct. If somebody could maybe update me and educate me. I haven't looked at Chapter 48 for many years, but there was a... Uh, requ there, are requir there were requirements for... Uh, a butters being notified and I've been told that butters have not been notified and there's been a lot of confusion I was told this afternoon that there was no hearing this evening what about others that might want to attend the hearing so I ask you to extend the hearing and I won't bring that up again uh, As they say, I'm not organized as I'd like to be. I'd like to give you a presentation on the drainage situation. It's very complex. It includes the, there's two major drainage points in the Lathrop community as it exists. One is uh, towards Bridge Road, and it, it uh, comes across this property that we're considering rezoning, and then continues on to Mr. Cotton's property and then underneath Hatfield Street, not road, to my property, and it causes this kind of damage. This is what you're looking at in these photographs. Uh, the other part of it is the second half, let's say, of the drainage of the Lathrop community goes directly into Pine Brook. Pine Brook is the brook that comes down from the Fitzgerald Lake area uh, to behind where I am and under Hatfield Street. And there's issues there where the, uh, the storm culvert under Hatfield Street is already too small. And we've had a number of instances in the last three or four years where that entire area along Hatfield Street, north of Hatfield Street, between Mr. Cotton's property and the other houses up on Hatfield Street, there's a large ravine through there has become completely filled with storm drainage to the point where it's overtopped Hatfield Street and begun to destroy Hatfield Street. Since that time we've added the 12 inch high pressure gas main for UMass which I brought up at a public hearing uh, with the state siting commission who totally ignored the fact that we're putting a 12 inch high pressure gas main unprotected in a vulnerable area and we have it it's there and that's part of the same drainage system uh, 
and I'll try to finish up here. Again, I request more time. Um, I'm a long-term resident. I've lived there for 60 years. Uh, I know that the zoning ordinance in general requires consideration for abutters and neighbors, and I'm requesting it. Uh, I think you're, tr you're continuing to trash my quality of life or the, what vestige of it is left. And uh, I'll leave it at that. And again, I request additional time to uh, give you a, a very detailed description of the drainage situation and how it relates to this zoning change and not just to a site plan approval. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the public that was just to speak to this? Yep. I'm Dave Cotton. I live at 736 Bridge Road and own the property at 248 Hatfield Street. And I'm at a little bit of a disadvantage because I didn't find out about this until 4.30 this afternoon. And um, Lathrop's been a good neighbor and uh, it's a good development. And we've coexisted for 24 years without any issues. And part of it is because the Thorntons have a, about 180 foot wide natural zone between us. And the nature of our business, I own cotton tree service. And we have always provided 24 hour emergency response when there are storms or powers out or people have trees that are on their buildings. And there's, there's a certain amount of, we try to be very considerate of the neighbors and we've never had any conflict with them. But with in the past four or five years with all the storms the crews have been working longer hours because of the storm similar to the one that we may have coming at us on Monday and what we had October 29th of last year and last year was just a, a gauntlet we were working 24 hours a day in cycling crews and we had people that had buildings that were crushed and of course power was out to a wide area which was really an issue for a lot of people and um, to support what Steve said in the 24 years since Lathrop developed it, um, we've seen dramatically increased flows across my property, which we work around. Um, we can't use my meadow for three or four days as a rule after a significant storm because there's standing water and it's flooded. And the issue with the erosion on Hatfield Street has been significant. And with the, there's three gas mains that run down through the area. And I believe one is Berkshire, two are Berkshire and one's Bay State. And um, last year when the severe erosion happened on Steve's side, there were exposed gas mains. There were 33 feet of exposed gas main with a 20,000 pound storm drain structure undermined. That's what the photos were. And if that structure had toppled onto those gas mains, it would have sheared them. And the, release of gas would have been horrific for the people down below on Cook Avenue and even for Steve and for the big Y and for Walmart. Uh, if anything ever ignited, depending on where the shutoffs were, it would have been quite a catastrophe. The, the significance of it with the 12 inch high pressure main that fills a field that fuels the power plant at UMass is significant. And I don't know the thermodynamics on it, but if that thing ever ruptured, and Hatfield Street has seen significant erosion from the severe storms we've been having. And even now, I drove down it today, and there's the erosion, even though the city's done two emergency repairs within the last year and a half, there's a large section of the embankment that's starting to erode <coughs> right in the vicinity of the gas main. And if this storm comes through that they're calling for, and it has significant rainfall, every time we get more than three inches of rain in a 24-hour period, there's severe ponding on the north side and if we get additional rain it comes up and floods right over the top of Hatfield Street and that's where it seems to have the the main erosion but the the potential for severe uh, property loss or injury with the gas mains being exposed and and the weather being so uh, so unpredictable uh, is concerning to me and without any any knowledge of what would be the extent of the development on the Thornton's property, I have a lot of concerns about what would be safe or not safe with the situation. But as Steve said, if, uh, if there could be a continuance so we have more time to 
uh, study the situation and, and address the council on it and the planning board. It certainly would be appreciated. Okay, thank you. Yep. Anybody else? No. Questions? Uh, question for either Carolyn or Aaron. Um, if this didn't go through, what would their options be with, a pe with that piece to develop it? Um, I don't, I looked um, at plans that were not survey plans several months ago. I don't recall the details. Um, I think that um, they could do very little in terms of the number of units that they could add when, uh, as a rural residential zone because we don't have the same allowances for townhouse units. Um, but I don't, again, I don't remember the details. It was very conceptual at the time. Um, but, and of course, even with a development proposal, all the technical issues about drainage and um, stormwater management and um, you know sewage capacity and all of that would be addressed at the time of any proposal development. as opposed to a rezoning request. Mm -hmm. I, I believe the site's within the residential incentive overlay district. And that allows them to develop at URB densities if they have 33% of the units affordable. Right. Without any change. Without any change. Say that again. So we have something called residential incentive overlay, which in certain areas of town, basically it's the area so north the bridge road. But Valley Market, that parcel near what's now Valley Market brought right. forward, yeah, okay. Right. So it's basically from North King Street right by Valley Market all the way over to North Farms Road, I think, I think it's the exact boundaries. Um, so rural incentive is an incentive to create affordable housing, and in return for developing with 33% of the units affordable, um, you, we treat it as if it's URB district. So that's always an option, regardless of what happens with the zone, with the yes, zoning change. Interesting. Oh, yeah. yeah um, so, what would be the benefit or the reason that the planning board would recommend the zoning change without the development plan of development agreement? Yeah, development agreement. Because you said I think typically it's done that way. Well, if there are issues that, so as Wayne mentioned previously, there's, you know, there's been sort of a long-term look at Bridge Road and, and um, trying to determine, you know, appropriate fixes. There's nothing designed or planned or even funding for anything like that. But when a rezoning request comes in, if from a land use perspective the rezoning request makes sense, but there may be some technical issues or other issues that... Um, to help address neighborhood concerns, the city might enter into a development agreement as part of the rezoning. And so I think in this case, because of the concern about additional egresses onto Bridge Row, that development agreement um, we would suggest is necessary so that we can assure that um, no new impacts are created um, based on a rezoning that the city um, adopts. So I guess um, the impact, it, by not um, having that development agreement, that means that then with a rezoning they could have um, come forward with a permit application to um, create an access point on that lot, or someone in the future could potentially. Let me add, I mean, the reason I mentioned that we've looked at this area, including Steve Susco's house, you know, basically going all the way from, from Cook Avenue up to the site, is generally sort of coming out of sustainable North Hampton, we're talking about having, encouraging dense residential neighborhoods within walking distance of commercial areas. So within roughly six-tenths of a mile of a commercial district is a good place to have housing. So Hatfield uh, and Bridge Road are good places to encourage more housing. You know, rural residential is supposed to be exactly that, rural areas, Sylvester Road. Um, so this is, a, is an urban area where people could walk to Big Y, could walk to, to King Street. Um, and so by itself, if there was no traffic issues, this would be a good place for URB, the entire area. Um, and so that's why we say, yeah, it'd be ideal to do it. You know, Steve brought his petition. That was our advice, is it would be great to, to rezone his property URB 
if we can solve the overall area for doing it. Mm -hmm. Lathrop's, in essence, offering a potential solution of saying we're not going to create a new curb cut so it wouldn't have the traffic impacts. Mm -hmm. um, question on timing and the introduction of this. Uh, do we have any time constraints on acting on this? Because we're ordinances considering continuing our public hearing to our meeting on the 19th, which would solve some of the neighbors' interest yeah. in, in keeping it going. The, the only time issue is from whenever the boards close the public hearing, there's a 90 day clock. Okay. All right. So, but you can you know, continue your discussion, but um, I think we're going to vote to continue our public hearing until our meeting on the 19th, which would allow the neighbors at least that opportunity to come mm -hmm. and, and deal with us. Um, if and that keeps the clock open. And that keeps right. the clock open on it. So I just wanted to throw that out so you know that that's, and check what that timing was. Okay. I guess, you know, along those lines, I mean, Lathrop is coming forward with not without a plan, not with no plan to build, just with a plan to purchase with the expectation of the possibility that somewhere down the line they may build. At which point, if they do build, a lot of the issues that the voters are bringing up are issues that are going to be associated with if and when this parcel is ever built on. By rezoning it, today is the same as it is tomorrow. It's just right. got to say different zoning. But, but it's when and if anything's ever built on it that any more issues of drainage and traffic, uh, gas lines, and I mean, those are the times that we discuss them. So it's a time, I mean, we could continue it, but. Really, it's not an issue until somebody wants to build on it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, okay. if, if I understood what you said, we could not change the zoning at all. They could still build on it, but there would be just a different set of requirements regarding the affordable percentage. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't have to. And they wouldn't have to come back. They would still come to the planning board for a review. Okay, but they wouldn't have to. They wouldn't have to ask for the rezoning. Correct. Right. Okay. I'm going to just interrupt because we're going to give us just a moment. We're going to vote to continue our public hearing and depart and. <clears throat> Anyone who wants to come and continue at that point can. So, do I have a motion to continue to the 19th of November? So, so and second. second. Okay. Discussion. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. We'll okay. we at least will continue the discussion on the 19th. So, anything you want to refer to us then, we'd be happy to. Can you just do date and time, place certain. So, where um, do you meet? Five o'clock here, Council Chambers, on November 19th is what we're continuing to. So, if any of the neighbors want to come and continue with the ordinance committee, we'll be here at that time. Right. And Councillor Carney is the councillor for that neighborhood, so we have some expertise in, in the neighborhood. And we'll certainly review whatever you continue to do tonight or what you send along to us for that meeting. All right. Thank you. So, so one of the comments is, you know, the, the rules have changed significantly since 24 years ago, whenever it was. And one of the changes is now a, a, a stormwater permit from DPW. So. I'm assuming this is over an acre we're talking about. Again, I don't know. Oh, right. the plans, but if if right. they disturbed yeah. over, an, so yeah. they certainly need a special permit from you and a site plan from you, regardless of whether it's the RI zoning or, or the uh, URB, and I think <laughs> uh, DPW threshold, which is disturbing one acre of land. Okay. Yep. I heard two pieces of discussion. I'd like to comment on quickly. One was. Uh, that uh, any situation like this would be addressed uh, um, as part of a site plan review later when a development uh, proposal comes forward. And I, I just want to make sure everyone understands that the situation we have now was signed off at, by an engineering firm. <coughs> so, you know, it's not a foolproof, engineering is not foolproof. Uh, it's based on a single point analysis and that particular analysis. I still have that analysis. I just couldn't put my hand on it today. But it starts off with this sentence. We will assume the pre-development flow rate at point A, which is the point that, that comes on to Mr. Cotton's property, is such and such a number. Then they calculate a post-development number, compare them, and say, look how good we did. But it was based on an assumption. And the second point I wanted to make was that, uh, and this was brought up at that time, but it was ignored. Uh, <coughs> the second point is I'm uh, myself out of remembering what it was, but somebody just, oh, uh, that it doesn't, uh, 
you can de separate the development from the rezoning. <coughs> and I don't really think that's true because once you rezone it, it's forever unless you change it again. So the Lathrop Home could sell the property to somebody, whatever. So that the threat of the increased development potential and its effect on drainage and such things comes from the rezoning. So I think it really should be. <coughs> so thank you. Okay. Um, a question for the planning board. Um, I, I think rezoning a piece of property is a big deal to the neighbors, and so would we not have issued notices to the abutters? For, for map changes, <clears throat> notice goes to the parcel that's being considered for map change. And then we have, and then state statute also says we have to publicize in the newspaper. So that happened. The property owner was notified. And then we go above that and post the signs on the property. So there was a yellow sign on the property indicating the notice for abutters. Well, with no no mailing to the 300 foot, no. like we did with the permit. Can I ask, is that a change? Do you know? No. No. It used to be that. Carolyn, is that because kind of like what Steve said? There's nothing eminent if you make the change, and then if when there is something eminent, then every then the abutters are. Is that kind of the it's not a physical change, project? Yeah. Right? Okay. All right. Fran. Is, is there any reason under zoning to consider uh, flood control <coughs> or uh, storm, storm water management? It sounds like they're two separate yeah. things. We certainly consider it for inherent conditions that are unsolvable. So if land is, for example, in floodplain, Yes, we wouldn't recommend it being zoned. Right. So if land was all wetland. So in those things, those things that can't be solved. But you know, the, the standards now for both your standards, uh, Conservation Commission, <coughs> DPW, are no, no increase in peak flow. Um, and those are solvable with enough money um, and, so, and, and with doing the right design. So you don't, and you don't usually know that. I mean, until someone does a full design, it would be hard for you to assess the impacts of a project anyway. So yes, we do that first step of no, it's not floodplain, no, it's not in here. What's the appropriate amount of building? I mean, obviously, you've all seen this. There's some projects that you can't, you can't build as many units as zoning would allow because of site constraints. Mm -hmm. But that's what you find out when they, they do the detailed assessment. There's also, there is a, a stream that runs it to the rear, and that has a watershed protection overlay zone on it. Um, so there are additional rules for development within so many feet of that water course. Um, and, and then, of course, there's Conservation Commission permitting. So, you know, I think you would look at any kind of, um, you know, they would, they would have to assess the existing drainage conditions and what's happening and whether or not this project is the sole contributor to washouts downstream, or if it's a combination of development that has happened over the years further upstream, um, you know, I don't, I don't know. And just so it's clear, that sliver of property which they own, which comes out to Cook Avenue, mm -hmm. that has a stream in it, that's already covered by a conservation restriction, so that land can never be developed. In. I, don't think, I don't think it could be from a regulatory standpoint anyway, but given the CR, it could be developed. That's correct. Yeah. So we don't have a development agreement, agreement. With right. them at all, but we do have a commitment to do the development agreement. And we also have a, do we have a commitment to <coughs> no more curb cuts? That's the that's commitment. What, that's the the saying we commit to um, not putting any curb cuts for access to anything that might be development developed, and we would put that on the deed so that even if we sold the property. At some future date, there would not be additional. I might suggest the only change from the letter is in their letter they said um, agreement for no curb cut until the surrounding properties were zoned URB. I think you'd probably be asking for them to agree never to put a new curb cut there. Mm -hmm. So, 
if, if Lather buys the property with that agreement and then sells it to somebody else. The existing curb cut remains. So, if they sell so the existing curb cut remains. So For the house that's there. But because it's URB, could you, with that curb cut, could you ever put multiple units on that? Could you subdivide that? You could do a two-family home. That's the only thing. Is there enough furniture? Well, again, with the agreement, you wouldn't be allowed more than one curb cut. Right. Um, I don't know if there's enough. I don't know how much furniture they have. With the yeah, might be able, you, you might be able to do, I, I don't know, I'd have to look at the numbers, because you might be able to do a separate townhouse project just on that parcel, but only if there's enough furniture, and I don't know that there is. Yeah, I guess my thoughts on, I don't know, I mean, can we make it, is we, we're only making a recommendation to the city council. Right. As part of our recommendation, we're going to say that the development agreement is part of that recommendation right. with the proposed change that Wayne made. I guess, I mean, for me, until somebody develops it, that's that's where it's, where we're, our, it's, it's our issue. Um, so um, I'm not as worried about that part of it until somebody comes together with a plan. You know, but just rezoning, it's just, <coughs> it's, it's not, a, a, for us, it's not that right. big a change. Right. They bought it to build on it. I know, but we, I mean, without a plan, I mean, we can't, we can't rezone it. We, I mean, we, I, we could say we have a development agreement, but we want to see your plan before we rezone it. <laughs> but they're not going to spend money on engineering. It's not rezoned. Right. Because I mean, they can't I, meet zoning. It kind of opens up right. a weird door for us, too. I mean, if everybody who wants to do a project comes to us to rezone the land, it's, it's an odd precedent. Okay. That was also actually my question is, have we had anything? Like, I, and I, I'm a long timer, um, as you know, and I don't recall anything like this um, coming before us, where it's a sort of a, a rezone for a particular um, company? Yeah, not exactly like this, but River Valley Market, for example, was zoned residential and it was rezoned to be a highway business mm -hmm. with a development agreement in that case to contribute $150,000 to design the Hatfield North King Street intersection. Mm -hmm. The idea being, in that case, the issue wasn't, was also traffic, and if that intersection could get fixed, then we could accommodate River Valley Market. Um, the What's now the AT&T <coughs> Street? Mm -hmm. was rezoned with a development agreement, and that agreement required housing on the second floor and prohibited pornography use, because that was the issues for the neighborhood in those cases. So we've done this sometimes, not exa never exactly the same thing. Uh-huh, okay. Did we do something in Florence, remember when we were rezoning those, those buildings from SR to, or GB, remember the, the, oh, the, yeah. the, yes. well, the old brush company, was that what it was? Oh, oh that's Florence, right. Florence yeah, yeah. The work live. Yeah, that's that's right. also right. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. The live workspace. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hmm. yeah, so it'd be hard. I mean, it's, it, it would be odd to say, you know, chose the plans and we'll resolve it. I mean, they're, they're taking a risk in some ways. They're buying the land. We're rezoning it. But we haven't approved their plan. They, I suppose they can come together with, they can come forward with a plan if they need a special permit and a site plan. And not get they don't need exactly special, what they want. They won't need a special permit. Will they, they would because it's a it's an extension of the existing special. Oh, that's permit. right. I guess the answer is. I mean, if this wasn't a rezoning that made sense by itself, you're absolutely right. You shouldn't be approving it. I think it's because sort of based on sustainable Northampton, where he said we'd like to be encouraging development within walking distance of commercial areas. That's why, if you could solve the traffic issues, why it's it, to me it's a good site for redevelopment. But if we hadn't already had that language in there, no, it wouldn't be. You, I wouldn't do this a quarter mile up on, on Bridge Road where we're no longer walking distance from a commercial area. And um, not um, adding to the traffic problems. I mean, they're doing that just by not putting in a curb cut, and otherwise there's no traffic implications? It, that comes back to the special permit. You, it could well be at mm -hmm. some point, Lathrop's going to get to a point where you're going to require a traffic, a traffic signal there, mm -hmm. or you're going to require a, uh, a median the cars can't cross, those would all be perfectly appropriate to look at the special, look at the special permit condition. But, you know, the, the big issue in traffic is how many curb cuts, you know, it's that movement in and out is where we get crashes. This all goes through a curb cut, one curb cut, which then needs to be properly designed, and it may or may not be properly designed. <coughs> That's what I mean, I think my thinking is 
the zoning change in a general sense makes sense in that area but all these issues from traffic to curb cuts to drainage to all, all of the issues of, of substance we can't decide on now but we get a chance to decide on later and with the brook rubber, uh, running in the back you know who knows by the time they figure out what they can actually do while resolving all these issues it might be extremely limited um, but we wouldn't know that until something was presented in front of us but I don't think the zoning change in and of itself with the development agreement is inherently bad yes, yeah could you come up and Keep your name and address. <coughs> it's, it's probably a simple question, Andy Church. I'm sorry? When they put the original development in there, did you all rezone the land before they came forward with a plan? Because it used to be all RR in the beginning, right? Yes, it was rezoned. And was that done the way you're intending to try and do it now I mean did you rezone the land because they wanted to build on it, it predates me I was staffing Conscom when they came for a permit <coughs> before I got here so I don't know the answer of what the history was because it sounds like the same thing and if it was all RR before somewhere along the line they rezoned it and they, and they developed it so right. That's exactly right. might be good to find out how that worked last time I believe it was rezoned with a plan. I was part of it. I don't recall the details. Okay. Thank you. So we public comments still open. We can continue everything. We can close and we can make a recommendation with the condition of a development agreement and we send it on to ordinance who's there's the hearing is still open for the 19th, so the members who still have issues would have a second chance to air their opinions at that time. Um, or we cannot recommend it. Can, can you remind me what the options are? So it's either a positive recommendation or no recommendation? That you could not, you could opt not to make a recommendation. You, or you could say that you recommend against it, or you can vote to recommend. Okay, so but there's actually three done. options. Still moves on, yeah, but we've done that before. We've not, not, <coughs> yeah. not, not recommended, right? It doesn't stop. It, it still moves on. It always moves on. It moves yeah. on, but it, it, it doesn't give much guidance. On <laughs> right. Right, yeah. right. And, and four choices, because the fourth choice is in favor with conditions or with recommendations. Right, right. Granny. Well, I, I have nothing against continuing the hearing. On the other hand, I have really have nothing against the rezoning of the property either. If continuing the hearing would just bring forth testimony that has nothing to do with zoning, like stormwater concerns and things that aren't covered by other protections. Right. I think I see it the same way. I think as far as the planning board's concerned, it. I could, I could, I'd feel comfortable recommending this ordinance. Um, and, and like Franny said, I mean, I think the stormwater is a very separate issue. And it's obviously a problem that is existing right now. And I don't know if there's anything that the, the city can, you know, should be looking into this if it's, if it's quite the risk that's been presented tonight. Um, but that feels very different to me than the issue of that, that this fits in with, with sustainable Northampton and we're not using uh, <coughs> our traffic uh, problems or issues. So do we want to close public hearing? Devin, you struggling? <laughs> <You're facing laughs> I am actually. I um I understand that our job is to think about where we want to have development. I mean, it's it's really not a question of a development piece at this point because right. we have no plan. But it is, you know, I'm, I'm, um, I rely on the planning board to recommend areas that, 
you know, that's that's what zoning should do. It should encourage the kind of developments that you want to have in places that you can tolerate them. And n no one ever wants it, you know, a development next door to you. I understand that, but I think if you're the concern I have is that we're doing it for one parcel. I mean, I, I, I would accept your logic that it's a good area to develop. And it's not ideally walkable, but it's going to get there. You know, it's, um, um, and, and so I'd, I'd be much more swayed by a, a zoning change that just, that dealt with that corridor than I would one single piece of property. That's, that's what I'm sort of struggling with. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I, the I, issue in this case, just to address that a little bit, is that um, uh, you know it would take a long time to really make a wholesale rezoning of that area because we really do have to correct the traffic issues. And if there's an existing development that it has the ability to make its own restrictions in terms of ensuring that it's not going to increase the traffic. Um, I think that's the argument for doing it by one piece. So if a property owner, just an, a random, you know, the other um, resident that came in here just said they wanted a rezoning, well, there's not, it, you don't have the same ability to say, you know, restrict what might happen. It's not, and, and this piece is immediately but, so it's an expansion of an existing system. So again, sort of from a sustainability perspective, you're adding on to infrastructure that's already in place. I accept that. That's a good argument. It's also it's tw it's sort of tweaking. It's not picking out a spot inside some other zone. It's just sort of right. adjusting the boundaries a little bit and making something that's perfectly reasonable possible. Hmm. We were asked to consider holding the hearing open. Um, yeah. It's they're going to get the opportunity to redress the ordinance committee. So I think that responds to that request. So right. I, I don't know that I feel compelled to do the same. Right. I don't know what would be gained by that, as long as that opportunity still exists for the abutters, which it would, which it does. Well, and I think also it's, it's uh, with the members of the city council hearing it because they're the ones who are eventually going to make this decision. We're, all we're doing is making a recommendation. Right. And it's going to continue on no matter what. I move we close the public hearing. Second. Second. Stephen, all in favor? So, public hearing is closed. Say we can do a couple things. We can not recommend. We can recommend the conditions of the development agreement. We can not do anything. Just let it go through. Um, That's no recommendation, right? Right. Not a not recommending, but a no mm -hmm. recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> um, the consensus. What I'm sensing is is a recommendation with a condition. Of the development. Um, I don't know if anybody is still open for discussion. Well, this is a little bit of a cop out, but I think I would go with no recommendation. I, I what what Devin was saying, I mean I heard Carolyn's response and I thought it was a good response, but that is the concern that I have that it just doesn't feel I don't feel comfortable with it being a particular entity coming forward to doing to making the change. So I don't want to not recommend. <laughs> I don't think I feel that strongly about it, um, but I I don't I, I can't make a positive recommendation. I but that's just me. I think it's going to lose, right? I mean, it, we can well, do a straw I, poll. I, mean. I, I think your initial comment is what I feel like is that we are the group that should make we should have an opinion. So I, I mean, I, I feel right. like we're abdicating our responsibility. Thanks, Devin. <laughs> <laughs> she cited you in her argument, wow. saying, "Oh, I'm agreeing with you." I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I, I hear you. You're right. I mean, where the board that should give input, I just don't. Do you I, think continuing I don't, the hearing would no give you the information you need? Not for me, no. 
but I'm just, you know, I think other people have different opinions. I just mm -hmm. felt like I should weigh in since. Well, I mean, if you took out, if you if you took out the fact that Lathrop wants to build on it eventually, and it was just, if this came to us without that part of it, just said, hey, here's a parcel of land. We want to make it URB, and it fits all the criteria we want for URB. It's close to downtown or close to centers where you could walk to. Would that be any different? I think it's the ball exploding in the air. It's not gonna. It doesn't. Never gonna happen that way. I mean, I just don't think that's not. That's not a scenario we're gonna see. I mean, it would never happen. It would somebody would have to have an interest in the parcel, I think, and that's I think, well, I think the part that makes me uncomfortable. It. Where it would be, where the the one place where I could see us doing it, and this is something we talked about at the ZRC, is there are spots of like, for example, there's islands of URA in the middle of URB, mm -hmm. right, around Round Hill, and mm -hmm. there some of them make sense, some make no sense whatsoever. Right. You know, if we rezone those, because it's the right thing that those little pockets, it could be one lot or two lots, some are really small. You know, that would be re making it what it should be. So in a sense, this is, URB is a, it's a, probably what this should be anyway, mm -hmm. even if it, Lathrop wasn't there. So I, I, what I guess I'm saying is that doesn't, the fact that Lathrop's involved, does that really sway you? Is that the thing that's really troubling you? I guess, yeah. Because there's an interest, it's attached to an interest. It's not us saying what's the best zoning here, the way we've been very intentional about it over the last couple of months. Um, I mean, I recognize it could. This could be seen as an opportunity to do good zoning, but that's it's not the situation we're in. Yeah, I guess I'm, I mean, I'm not struggling with it as much because if it's if if it's it would be better if we could come up with that whole corner, right. you know, and make that whole corner URB. I mean, that would have been do it all at once. You know, use this as a motivation. Um, but I don't think that's going to happen. So, um, and for me, I'm just more concerned when somebody builds on it than it is at this point. You know, because that's I think where we're going to have the most impact on it. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, mean, I would be comfortable moving it ahead with a recommendation with the conditions, mm -hmm. uh, including Wayne's uh, addition to the the. the well, this. The condition appear in the ordinance in the zone, or how does that? You make a recommendation to council that they vote in favor if the development agreement is executed by the time it comes to council. Okay, them. good. All right, I'd like to make a motion that we recommend the amendment on statute uh, 350-3.4, based on a request by Lathrop Communities, to make a zoning map change, <coughs> 716 Ridge Road Map 18C3. From rural residential to urban residential, B. Um, this uh, amendments. What the suggestions? Or the recommendations? One, which was the development agreement. Right, development agreement to be in place prior to city council. Right. Language that you reference. right with so so no new curb cuts because the development agreement, ha even if the zoning for the other right. properties right. eventually happens. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Second, Stephen. All in favor? Opposed? So the recommendation moves forward to uh, council. Or there will be ordinance. ordinance. Uh, there'll be a on the 19th at they said five o'clock yeah. here in uh, the chambers. There'll be the Ordinance committee will be meeting on this issue, so any of us who have any uh, issues with it can air their concerns at that time. It's closed at this point. So. Should I, I left Mr. Jasky with a handkerchief. Thank you. Okay, what do we have next? Ground mounted solar. Unnecessary. Um, well, we have two guests tonight. Um, uh, building commissioner, 
and Louie. Um, basically, uh, Energy Commission. So um, basically, this is sort of revisiting the whole issue of the special permit criteria for ground method other than over a parking. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be my turn. Oh. So um, as you, I don't know if you remember the last special permit hearing, um, uh, Louie came and talked to you all about um, generally about this issue, and then we talked about so, having them come back and talk in more detail about it. And you actually have another special permit coming up um, in two weeks for the ground the so, The same basic thing? Yeah, same, same issue. So, um, Louis Hasbrook, the Building Commission for Northampton, to have the Planning Board uh, consider changing the setback requirements for ground-mounted solar uh, as, ex as an ex when it's an accessory use to a one family well. Uh, and accessory would be defined as you know, 100 or 110 percent of the ca demand capacity of the dwelling unit. Uh, or the or the dwelling units, and to consider the ground mount solar as a uh, an accessory structure and and put the requirements for setbacks the same as any other accessory structure in the zone. Um, the uh, and I'll let Chris uh, Mason speak to the sort of the our city's commitment to energy uh, to sustain energy, and then I'll come back with some specific. <coughs> Chris Mason, the Energy and Sustainability Officer for the city. And as Louis said, I'd like to be able to kind of put this in context of the Sustainable Northampton Plan and some of the other plans that uh, the uh, cities make commitments to. Um, uh, so look at the Sustainable Northampton Plan. One of the uh, guiding principles um, is to significantly improve energy efficiency in city buildings and programs, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and encourage conservation and use of alternative and renewable energy sources throughout the community. So that's one of our guiding principles is we'll, you know, we want renewable energy. Um, <clears throat> there's a goal, and <clears throat> what I'm going to do is just kind of step through the pieces I found in this plan that address this, that, uh, that, that, um, that touch on this. Um, <clears throat> so one of the goals is to reduce the communities and the city's energy demand and natural resource consumption. And they have some objectives under energy savings that include uh, facilitate the increased use of renewable energy in private buildings. Um, I'm not reading the entire piece here. I'm just kind of pulling out the pieces that are pertinent to this. So there are other things. Including they also want to increase energy efficiency, et cetera. So, so, um, increase utilization of energy for renewable sources and reduce utilization of energy provided by, uh, from limited resources such as oil. Encourage development that maximizes building orientation and landscaping to increase energy savings. So that would be, you know, you get solar, it could fit into that. Um, and then the measurements of progress. Um, uh, one of the measurements of progress there is the number of buildings with solar collectors providing a portion of the building load. So, you know, the guiding, one of the metrics in the sustainable method plan is just how many residences and commercial buildings can we start providing from the energy through renewables. Um, a second goal is to redu reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases. And, and one of the objectives is to connect pertinent city policies to the greenhouse gas emission reduction goals of sustainable Northampton. Another one is to encourage and work with the city's residential, business, and commercial sectors to help them reduce their greenhouse gas emissions through, amongst other things, energy source switching. Switch from one, one case might be fuel oil to natural gas, it has a lower greenhouse gas emissions, but going to solar is most certainly a switch that has a lower greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the strategies and actions uh, listed under that goal or that objective uh, prepare an incentive program that would motivate residents and businesses to implement increased, amongst other things, use of renewable energy systems in existing buildings. So the Sustainable Energy Plan is asking us to encourage this actually provide incentives if at all possible. Make it, make it easier to happen. Um, 
Create an awards program. This is another strategy or action. Create an awards program for improvements in energy efficiency at the built environment for both city agencies and private sector development. That one's not directly with renewable energy. Gives you the flavor. And another one is provide incentives, such as bonuses and waivers, and the land use regulations for new construction to achieve certification for high efficiency and green building standards. So again, not another one that directly affects renewable energy, but it gives you the flavor. Um, <clears throat> Under the Appendix A, under potential regulatory actions, is to consider design guidelines or other land use standards to maximize solar access, in parentheses, availability of sunlight to provide solar space heating, electricity, and hot water. So just uh, uh, design guidelines to, to maximize people's ability to use solar uh, was listed as a, um, a potential regulatory action. So Northampton is also a green community, and we've took on, uh, as part of that, we did as of right siting for renewable energy slash alternative energy. And in that, we made it easier for large arrays, 200, over 250 kilowatts, in certain parts of town, uh, we made it easier for them to get established. Um, uh, that doesn't quite get to this piece, but again, it shows the city's already taken actions to promote renewable energy in new ways. The, in January 2008, Northampton signed a memora memorandum of agreement for promoting and implementing the Pioneer Valley Clean Energy Plan. Uh, I'm sorry, the goals from the Pioneer Valley Clean Energy Plan. And uh, those goals include site sufficient new capacity to generate 214 million kilowatt hours of clean energy annually in the Pioneer Valley by the end of 20, 2009, and another 440 million kilowatt hours per year by 2020. And uh, second goal is to reduce our gre region's greenhouse gas emissions by 80% below year 2000 levels by 2050. So neither one of those goals have been met yet. Um, the, the, the entire region is actually moving pretty, pretty forward, uh, is moving forward on it um, better than other parts of Massachusetts. But uh, we haven't gotten there yet. Um, then there's also three, let's see. Yeah, three, so three state actions. The Massachusetts Clean Energy and Climate Plan for 2020, the state's Green Community Act, and the Global Warming Solutions Act um, have all led to uh, in, um, extensive state economic support for solar electric. Uh, so there's state and federal tax credits. Mass Clean Energy Center provides really nice rebates. Um, state legislation support for net metering, so it makes it easier for you to um, uh, capture all the benefits of solar uh, because the sun is unbalanced and the, it's more of it in the summer than it is in the winter. And we actually might use more electricity in the winter than we do in the summer. So. Um, and the sale of SREX, uh, Solar Renewable Energy Certificates. Uh, now, I bring this up because uh, solar is booming right now. Uh, it's because a lot of it, it's highly incentivized by the state, and uh, it, it's a good payback. Because this is the time you want to be able to put it in. So, to take part of our residents and, and make it difficult for them to take advantage of these incentives right now, I think is doesn't really go with what the Sustainable Northampton Plan is trying. Um, the state's got an, uh, a goal for installing solar of 250 megawatts by 2017. And the installed capacity as of October of this year was 162 megawatts. So again, we're not quite there yet, even for the state goals. So let's kind of put it in context. Um, and I think I'll just uh, briefly say um, that it does strike me that uh, solar array, although I think Lou's going to get to this as well, but just personally though, solar array is an, is an accessory to your building. It's something that you want to, you know, you have it for, to perform some function for your building. And it shouldn't really be any different than building a shed or building a barn, you know. If you have, to have a, a, a different set of regulations for the solar, it's kind of a common sense thing from my point of view, doesn't make sense. Uh, but that's still what I haven't planned. That's how it's, uh, that's to put it in context for this discussion. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Just add, add the context. I don't want to disagree with Chris. I mean, I actually be totally fine with allowing the, the solar PV by right, Chris is saying. But it's one of the context is 
there's a lot of other things in the state of Northampton as well that have to do with character of neighborhood and other issues. This came before you all. If you remember, you allowed, you recommended allowing solar PV in four circumstances. Um, on rooftops, regardless of how much energy is generated to not just accessory uses, above driveways and parking lots, regardless of how much energy is generated, a way to actually incentivize people putting these on top of asphalt. Um, by right and large arrays in certain locations, specifically the landfill and the airport, uh, and then by special permit elsewhere. Um, and I think at the time, you all grappled, and staff actually recommended what Chris is saying, so allowing them everywhere. But, but I think you all felt like there was a balance between all the energy things that Chris is absolutely right about, but also neighborhoods, you know, someone having a vista and their next door neighbor suddenly having a large solar panel field through there. Um, but in the um Proposed zoning changes we recommended for URA, B, and C. I think we got rid of that's correct. Special permit as long as it was under, I can't remember, it was 100 or 200 percent of it. I think it's 200. It was that's right. So I think that's where we are. We're, 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 is that 200 the number? Yeah. We're up to 200 percent. Um, is that by right? No, it's not by right. Mm -hmm. Isn't that why Melnick came before us? Well, he's under the current zoning, which the is current. It's the, the stuff right. we recommended right. hasn't been adopted. <laughs> I, think, I think we're looking for a up to 100% by right, between 100 and 200 by permit. Because in the, the urban residential. In the, right, right, right. You are A, B, and C. Right. Right. Right now it's just up to 200% by permit. And so but, the thought right. is. What, what, what is it in SR? It's um, anything, anything that's not covering driveway or, or parking area is special permit. And then there's a 50-foot setback. Yeah, the from the property boundary. So there's t two issues. One is the setback for the s for the panels, mm -hmm. and then the other issue is at what threshold would a special permit be triggered? Is it just for the um, accessory to a house, or is it if you're generating, you know, if you're essentially becoming a mini power company, right. would that trigger special permit? And that's what we're trying to avoid. Right. Somebody with a big yard, you know, producing 400 percent of their house's capacity and right that but that's where but, but last week right. or two weeks ago when we had the two special permits we had to do for what really should have been right those were 100 percent or right. less than the house's capacity they met setbacks so the thought was why by right why are we why are we here right why shouldn't that be allowed by right the, the thing that seems absurd to me is the 50 foot setback that it means, I, mean, I could have solar panels in my backyard if they were zero feet wide because I have a hundred foot lot, and that, I mean, it's obviously there's room to put solar panels back there. Well, I think is that what I mean? We haven't let Louis speak yet, but I think that's what. <laughs> yeah, the proposal but, is to get to. Okay. That's it. Uh, a couple of maps. One puts the area that I'm going to speak to in context. Um, it's the Ryan Road neighborhood, and the others are close up. And I I chose this neighborhood because last special permits were specifically about this neighborhood. I circled on the upper portion of the neighborhood. Um, two of the lots that would be, that would have the setback required for putting solar arrays in. If you look at all the other lots in the area, um, almost all of them wouldn't allow, wouldn't have the space to fit a ground-mounted solar array, That's right. given the 50-foot setbacks. Uh, some of the houses are going to have plenty of room on the roof. Some of the houses are going to be oriented the wrong way. The, it happens that the person who was here for a special permit didn't have roof planes pitched in the right direction. Some of the roofs aren't going to be big enough, so these houses are awfully small. We've uh, denied permits for roof-mounted arrays because people couldn't demonstrate that the roof was strong enough to hold the array up. And so I'm encouraging that we drop back that we drop in, and this is a WSP overlay, and I believe the WSP, and these were the uh, two special permits that we had looked at, and I believe those uh, ordinances, are, those regulations are already in place. Um, I don't know what the proposed setbacks in the UR, A, B, and C um, proposals that are coming forward, but, but I'd, uh, I'd encourage the planning board to consider um, treating these ground-mounted solar arrays as the same as any other accessory structure. Um, they're, um, 
the zoning does make an allowance for accessory structures. It sets, it sets a, a actually minimal setbacks, 15 feet in the front, four on the side, and four on the rear for most of the uh, residential zones. And then some of them are some of the uh, suburban and rural residential uh, setbacks are larger. But I'm not sure what the difference between um, a, a thousand square foot barn that's <coughs> 20, 20 feet tall to the mid pitch of the roof and a solar mounted array is there are regulations that limit the amount of lot coverage that that a structure can have an accessory structure um, and I'm not I'm not sure that that the aesthetics of a solar array are necessarily that much different from the aesthetics of a, um, of a garage or a barn or a poorly constructed shed and we don't we haven't uh, put any buffer regulations in for those. And then the one last piece I'd add is that it, it, if it were if it were true that that they, there wasn't a set the uh, adequate setbacks to put the ground mounted solar array and there wasn't space on the roof, um, somebody could build a, a, a totally rudimentary shed and put the solar panels on the roof of that without um, any discussion at all. So, and and so I'm encouraging them to have have the the, the <laughs> setbacks and the and the uh, <laughs> reconsidered at least, uh, and um, both for the WSP and then as as the other U R um, A B and C um, regulations go forward. What are the setbacks for accessory structures in URA, B, and C? Um, 15 front, four side, and four rear. Four? Yeah. And I think the proposed setbacks, I'm not sure you could correct me on this, but I think the proposed setbacks are going to be, for principal structures, are going to be 10 feet side. Just in the C district? Just in the C district. Yeah. And then for a principal structure, it's, it, it would be 15 feet side. Uh, lot coverage would still be an issue if you wanted to pour a concrete slab to put them on, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Remember when we approved the ones up on Chesterfield Road that were that were on s planted rods as right. opposed to is that uh, is that counted as coverage or not? I, I think you'd count. Um, a solar a set of solar panels as lot coverage. It doesn't so the foot, footprint of the array pervious structure because water will make it down through, but it certainly be construed as lot coverage. Well, by a structure, I, I'm surprised at that answer. I mean, that's that's the whole point. It is because of pervious. It, it is for rainwater drainage. That's why we care about the coverage, it's, isn't it? Not all of it. No. Yeah, that's what I care for yeah. the areas. That's what yeah. You want to fill out the, the whole land. I was thinking we talked about this, yeah, because you could, the, um, if, you, if it was a pole and you didn't, couldn't you cover the, you didn't cover your entire lawn, you'd become like a little power station. That was the word. Okay. I think it goes back to accessory structure. An accessory, you know, if you were to, were to have a structure, a solar array that produced twice as much, you'd, as power as you'd use, you'd become it become a business, and you know potentially you could come back under the home occupation or home business, and it would be sort of an outward manifestation. But but, but you in terms still of the accessory, it would have to be accessory to the to the whatever well, uses on the lot. Right. Um, I don't think somebody wanting to sell excess power back to the electric company makes it a, a business, a home business. And I, it seems to me that you might want to encourage that because it will reduce the need to produce electric power somewhere else with other, by other means or by non-solar means. So I mean, it, it, it's not as simple. Pardon? Except you'll get more lot coverage. I think that was the point of the special mm -hmm. permit, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but things are going to change, and at some point, maybe solar panels have become twice as efficient as they are now, which is eas could easily happen. Does that mean that you have to take half of them down? Or, you know, I mean. I, I yeah. will. 
I will say that the, uh, the state has put in um, a provision for neighborhood net metering under the idea that if you have a couple of houses where a couple of them are, are too shaded by trees or something else, and one person wants to put in a larger array, they can then uh, net meter the electricity to over to other houses. So it's not really necessarily a business. It's more like a, a sh kind of a community garden um, type thing. Right. So that is. I, I at this point, I'd like to keep it in a little box. <laughs> um, you know, we may open the door to there certainly be plenty of room for discussion down the road. I think there's a lot of different ways to look at it, but what I'm advocating for is, you know, based on the on-site consumption, a panel that panels of that size. And your suggestion was 100% uh, or 110%? Uh, I think, uh, I mean, I've seen 100, 110, and 125. Um, I'd leave it to you folks to pick. So if I agree to buy a really inefficient refrigerator, can I have a bigger PV array than my neighbor who is a really efficient? <laughs> <laughs> as long as you get, but we're, the other constraints are in place. The percentage of lot coverage, right. you know, square feet, percentage of lot coverage, those sorts of things. I'm just thinking, it, <laughs> if the issue we're really trying to think about is how much lawn area is okay for my neighbor to cover before I get upset, it might be better to translate that into square footage. I, you know, 110% of the average house is mm -hmm. X feet, and that might be a fair way to do it. Right, because I think if you, as to follow up on what Frandy said, if you, if the discussion is what the footprint of the array, how much it takes up in the, in the yard, that's one thing. If, if it's how much energy it produces, well, in, in, if, a, if an array today would need 20 by 40 square feet, but that same square footage 10 years from now will produce five times as much energy because of advancement and so forth, that they'd have to come back to us. Nothing physically is changing, but they'd have to come back for a special permit or something because it's more efficient. So that doesn't make sense if... They'd probably have to get a new panel anyway to capture They would. <laughs> they would. But I'm no, saying if... So. The other would be, you know, if people got rid of their refrigerators, so you put, yeah. <laughs> you put an energy efficient refrigerator and compact fluorescent lights, and all of a sudden your energy demand goes way down, you go. then now you're in that situation when your array is. If the board wanted to do it in square feet, based on 110 or 120 percent of the average house, mm -hmm. do you know what that translates to? Um, 600 to 800. But wouldn't we do it? Based on lot, going back to lot coverage would be the right way to, to well, limit it. two separate standards, lot coverage and then maybe a maximum. Well, that would be interesting. I mean, this is really taking it down to the course. But yeah. if it's 600 square feet for a for, you know, panel and then you have a, a garage and your garage roof doesn't work because of loads or what have you, now you're going to be in excess of 1,000 square feet. Well, no, I think, I, I mean, I think we've got some, I mean, there's some pretty, um, I'm a big fan of not changing things that don't need to be changed, um, partly because I can't remember to look at the new regulations. I'm, I'm comfortable, you know, having things consistent. But there is a consistency to, to um, accessory structure lot coverage. Um, and uh, it's based on a maximum amount and also a percentage of the, uh, of the existing lot. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd include it in, in I'd use those that same set of criteria to judge it, and it may I'm really. Well be, I'm really swayed by building the cheap the, the cheap little structure and putting it on. Putting it on top, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But is the, but is the measurement cumulative? Yes, it is. It is a cumulative measurement. It says not to exceed a thousand square feet of lot coverage, or, and I don't remember what. The, there's also a percentage attached well, to that's, accessories. That's the change. Is that this forty percent? Say again. Is that that's forty percent that's in there? I mean, that's another possibility that we. No, I think there's two percent. So there's accessory a de detached accessory structure. You all have looked at for at least A, B, and C to have either a square footage or a maximum percentage. So there's, you know, a little bit of a weighing there. But then the forty percent has to do with whether or not a structure is considered accessory to the principal. Can you have you can have <clears throat> multiple accessory structures and nothing to stop you from having two barns or right. two as shows. long as you don't exceed the the, the cap. Right. On the other hand, I think a, a resident is more likely to fill up the backyard with solar panels than it is with little sheds. Another hand been my case. Uh, chickens and dogs. And <laughs> yes. Yeah. So Wayne, what you suggested was was something that I was sort of concerned about was how do you determine 
what the usage of the house is to go back to feet, or historically for what the bill has been before. I mean, I, I see, it seems to me that the impact of the solar panels is not how much power they produce, but how right. much room they take up. Right. So I, mean, I th I'm, I'm very much in favor of, of easing the rules here and certainly not requiring a special permit under all circumstances, but under some, I would think. But I think we have to come up, somebody, I don't know who is going to draw this up, is the energy czar or, or whatever that it's. Well, also, how does it affect where we are in the pipeline with the URA, B, and C? Are they going to City Council yet? Because this will change what we just proposed. No, we, we're going to maybe talk about that later tonight. <laughs> in our short meeting. I know. <laughs> I, I, I don't think it's making a fun decision. I think we're looking for feedback in part because the thing that's not allowed by right is based on the feedback we got you last time. So we originally had an ordinance that would have allowed these by right, and you want us to pull back a little bit. So I think now having a couple of special permits under your belt, you know, hearing from Chris and Louie, the question is, are you comfortable reopening this, in which case Carol and I can work on language and bring it back to you. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think any of us, well, you know, I don't think I want to be, you know, in any way inhibiting people from doing this. Right. I think we want to make it as easy as possible to do as much as possible right. with these. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what I don't, what, I'm not sure if this brings up a, a conversation we should have about, you know, everybody saw the article in the paper today about Hatfield. Hatfield doesn't have, right now in their zoning, how to handle larger arrays. You know, there's the, 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 the it's a for-profit entity of a non-profit company. I'm not sure how that works. Um, who is trying to build something in Hatfield and they're going through the building commissioner instead of the planning board because it's easier. So, so one approach, you know, a single family home is going to be four to eight kilowatts. Is that the right ballpark? So one approach is to say, you know, it's accessory if it's below eight kilowatts or, or whatever the right number is. Anything else is still your special part. Well, but, but I don't, I also don't want us to get, in, I mean, I want to encourage even a large scale you know, if eventually we cap the landfill, you know, I know the state changed the law that allows solar rays on, on landfills, but what if somebody with a large piece of property wants to put in, you know, a, a, a bigger installation? Is that something that, that could still be special permit, which is what it is now? Well, what is it today? Yeah. I mean, do we, ha do we have zoning right now that if somebody wanted to put in a large scale solar array that's other what, than on a landfill? That's what Pat came to you for. Pat Malinek came to you for. So the no, that, was was, that was accessory, but that was still ex no. We're talking about what these guys are trying to do. Have, this is like a farm, solar farm, right. solar farm. We do in some districts, so we, you don't allow it in SC. You allow it by right at the airport and at the landfill, and then you allow it uh, with a special permit in some districts. I forget which districts it is. So if some of, if a farmer wanted to take a field that he's not using, the, the, the meadows. A Ag commission was recommending against. The meadows because that's such valuable farmland. So, if a farm wanted to do it on Sedesta Road, yes. If they want to do it on Hunts Road, no. Right. So we don't. We. It, I guess back to my my question was: Do we have to? Should we? If we're going to look at this for accessory structures, do we have to look at it for these larger installations? You know, so we don't have the problems that we're seeing over in Hatfield. Or well, do you think we're maybe? I mean, we can always reevaluate and bring it to you and think whether. I think it's something. Yeah. If, if we're going to do it now, it might as well take a look at it and bring it at the same time because. I mean, sooner or later, it's going to come to us. You know, it's, it, it's happened in Amherst. It's happened in East Hampton. It's happened in Hatfield. It hasn't happened to us yet, but I'm sure it will. Right. And it seems to make sense to me that we, that just personally, that we, if we want to set a limit on it, that we do it based on something like accessory building and not based on a limit of the percentage. I mean, if... I agree. I, that, that seems to be a sort of push me pull me kind of thing. We're trying to encourage it, and then we say, well, "But we don't want to encourage it too much." Right. So I don't. The problem to me would be how much area it takes up. Right. Which would be consistent. With. So I would want then there to be into the definitions put, um, you know, um, solar array accessory, you know, so that so that there was a way of defining. It's not something that something that, that carried consistently through all the different um, zoning districts, and and by by being able to go to the definitions and see the how it was written. Mm -hmm. Would would an overlay zone for the whole city work? It would only come to Why not? <laughs> 
that through city council. Yeah. Standing. Yeah. Well, I don't think we're quite ready to put pen to paper on this thing yet. No, you're just looking. For certainly. Yeah, I think you're giving us feedback. Right. Yeah. But Louis's thoughts are certainly have a great effect on what goes in there. But somebody has to write it. Is that the planning department? I think so. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what we well, for. <laughs> <laughs> so we're looking for, the, for, 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 when you say you're looking for it written, we're looking for something other than making it an accessory. You're looking for a staff to come back to you with changed language based on your conversation. Yeah. Real zoning. She's going to come back to us with like zoning and dimensions and things. Okay. Then we can pick it apart then shoot holes in it. <laughs> I was going to give Louie what he wanted tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I think this makes think sense. I think before idea. we were coming at it, it was well intended, but we're coming at it thinking of how much energy is being produced and how much space will that production require and so forth. And in the end, if you look at it from the other angle, it's just an accessory I was thinking structure. of it from the neighbor's conflict. Right. Yeah, it's, it's a variation on NIMBY. It's not in your right. backyard. <laughs> How okay. You pronounce that? Nerby. Okay. Good. Thanks, guys. What do we have next? We've got some holes in committees. Is that what yes. this is? Committee holes. So, um, we have. You all discussed several months ago about new committee assignments, and um, I didn't send the list out, I suppose. Um, so based on the change in the board, um, and then change of some board members to different committees, we still have a gap in the, uh, in the tree committee representation, which is staffed out of the DPW, and it's... Um, I don't know what their meeting schedule is. I'm not sure that it's that regular. Wayne, do you have any I sense? Mm -hmm. um, but um, Andrew was on the tree committee the last, I think, um, mm -hmm. before he left the board. And, um, you know, it's basically policy of, on city street trees and, and holding public hearings to say goodbye to trees or decide on whether trees get, city trees get taken down and sort of then replanting and all of that. Um, and then we also have a slot that needs to be filled on economic development, housing, and land use, which is sort of a subcommittee of council, although it has lots of other members. <laughs> <laughs> Planning board and conservation commission member and um, besides city councilors. Mayor slot. Mayor gets to oh, mayor just points out a uh, uh, citizen. Basically, planning board slot is a non-voting slot. They take part in all the discussions. I was going to say, why do they need someone from planning board with that list? But yeah, just a joke. Because <laughs> <laughs> it covers all the issues that the planning board deals with. <laughs> um, and many so with economic development, housing, and land use, many times. Or zoning ordinances that are going to city council get referred to economic development, housing, and land use for not public hearing so much, but discussion. So um, the last zoning packages for, um, can't keep track of them all, but I'll put King Street, for example. When that rezoning package went through, it also went to Ed Lou for comment and discussion. In times Ed Lou before it's formally submitted to, and sort of the still the brainstorming phase. Right. Um, and they meet once a month on Tuesdays, Mondays. During the day, something. Right. Actually, they switched it to late afternoon. I think five o'clock. And a substantial number of them are canceled. So they, they schedule a meeting once a month, but if there's nothing to to do, they don't meet. <laughs> Um, so it's either a Monday or Tuesday afternoon, I think, isn't it? Are you checking? Welcome for the last one, yeah. Um, and then the last one, um, oh, transportation and parking. Wayne can talk all about that, or 
Devin. Are you still yeah, going to Devin. those or? But the so Devin moved over to CPC. Oh, that's so what it was. Hey, that's yeah. Uh, so you're there until somebody takes your spot. Those of known volunteers, Devin. That's right. So you're there, <laughs> but you're there. <laughs> I'm kind of torn actually, but it's a it's. Um, it oh, meets twice a month. It meets at 4:30. Um, that conflicts with another board I'm on that I, that I don't make half their meetings. So it has been a little problematic to me, although I probably would still go to some of them just to keep going. Right. So Ed Lou is Tuesdays at 5, the first Tuesday of the month. <coughs> and TPC is <coughs> second and fourth at Four thirty. Second and fourth Tuesday. And is that a voting slot? Okay. So then that's sort of that you all review traffic mitigation disbursements and um, other policy rear back in angled parking. Yeah, it, <laughs> it's an informative <laughs> group because it's got yeah. the police chief and Ned Huntley, so head of DPW, and uh, um, usually one of the engineers from. I mean, so it's a, it's a group that you learn something from. Right. You also get to, well, I guess the, they they're the ones you guys just got uh, the traffic mitigation money. You guys spend that, so you get to spend. Um, city council does that. I mean. Well, well, you guys get to make the record. I mean, hopefully, right. based on what we decide tonight, right. you guys make the recommendations to city council. You will now have a calendar. Yeah. There we go. So. Uh, I'm already on housing partnership. I can't take on anything else. So I'll speak for myself. Put me on one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got to pick one. Trees, economic development, or trees. parking. That was a very good move. Trees. My wife will be proud of you. We yeah. have a taker. <laughs> it's very hippy dippy. Air. <laughs> actually, one of the things they did was they I love got that. a grant from National Grid to give out trees to the city city residents. Yes. So oh. you, you send me information about when, where, what, all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. In fact, I might have something for you now. <laughs> <laughs> so They've been looking yeah. for somebody. <laughs> <laughs> um, great tree from that process. Now, the worry. thing is, Anne's okay. not here. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh, so she put her on. Oh, you are? Oh, I forgot about it. Are we Are we a full board now? No, we're still we're down. One, we're down. One short, right? Do we have anybody in the pipeline? Wasn't there? I know somebody yeah. interviewed a few people. Yeah. It was one person. Yeah. Was trying for a long time. <laughs> I know. I think he was. Oh, yeah, he was interviewing somebody last week. Was it? Another one of your buddies? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good guy. <laughs> who, who is it? Can you say? Um, hmm. After. Okay. Um, but um, so do we still need Ed Lou then in parking? And, yeah, transportation. I'd go. I'd do Edley, but it's Tuesdays. So I'm in Boston. That's it. That Edley takes would be, care of both of those for you. I know Edley would have been fun. That's. I mean, that's, that sounds like. A, but we don't vote. We don't. It's not a voting member. All right. right. The, the other thing they do is they evaluate requests for TIFs, um, where you know, tax increment finance. No, no, but a planning board member to Edley isn't a voting right. spot. Right. But you could you know, talk. You <laughs> most <laughs> things by consensus. So <laughs> drink lots of coffee and talk a lot. <laughs> Yeah, it's too bad. So, so we don't have so Edlu and transportation, transportation and parking. Transportation and parking. Okay, so I'll ask Ann, would you come back? Yeah, to give John Edlu. When no, Devin stays on Twitter, trees. Pick trees. There's no comparison. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I did trees. <laughs> <laughs> Very smart to jump in. <laughs> All right. We could assign hand to one of the other ones, which is not. I suppose it's yeah, not nice. be on two committees. Well, we can maybe. Just, we, well, if you guys want to think about it, we can hold off till the next meeting. But those are the two open now. And we do that in next and 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 and, 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 and generate a list of who's on what. Yeah. 
Maybe. Well, so maybe we can Ed shame Lube. somebody into it. It's one almost a no-brainer. Ann goes on Edlu because that's the one open, and I'm still holding down transportation parking until you get another member. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well done. So we're set. Okay. Sort of. Okay. Okay. Screwed again. <laughs> we're set. <laughs> I'll tell Ann the good news. <laughs> yeah. So it is written. It was Uh, last up, our review of minutes. From we got three weeks of minutes, three yeah. meetings. Oh, they sent a while. Yep. They were we were, we were going to do them at the last meeting, but that meeting you weren't here. You don't realize that <laughs> no, it was right. late. It's a short yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. 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 we're yeah. in and out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, as far as the minutes go, there's a, there's a few typos. Let me want to go home. I was okay. And you should change in the, in the text where it says Brandy Johnson. You probably should change it to Francis. Oh, I thought I always had it in there. Weird. Uh, you automatically auto fill. Oh, nice. Well, don't change, don't change the yeah. oh. Frandy up here to uh, No. Thanks. Um, let's see. They're nice, aren't they? Those are nice kicks. Those are sweet. Those are nice kicks. Sherry and I even wear Okay, on uh, <laughs> page five. There are some two two cues, I'm telling you. Five. Which, which uh, minutes? I must have been the long one. H5 on September 13th. Oh, yep. Uh, third, third paragraph from the bottom. I think another says for anything. for your phone, buddy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's sustainable. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> then there's a couple of strange. Um, let's see. Page two of September 27th is. Janet Reaney Langworthy Road noted the reason Langworthy and Ward are you are you Jones is thy because of the description. Right here. I got that one. <laughs> <laughs> Not that, that way or something. Yeah. Right. Right. And, um, and then on that same same minutes, next paragraph. Yeah. Four. It's a TSA approved. Yeah. So Okay. And then on page two on September 13th, was, uh, the third paragraph down, right described the relocation of super service and also explained what I. Well, it's, it's okay. just a minor What the? Um, <laughs> that, that's simple. Simple. So, so cross pollination with Berkshire County, huh? Yeah. Service yeah. Yeah. We were doing last time. Oh, really? That's where we're Was everybody oh, that said was there? <laughs> uh, I move we approve the minutes. Second. Actually, it was uh, all, uh, all in favor. Everybody say aye. Aye. Country Club? Let's be adjourned. Second. Darn! The floor recognizes Stephen Gilson. We're still on TV. All right, I withdraw my mic. What else do we have? So, so um, I don't see anything on. You have the wrong copy. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Um, what about U R A B and C? Don't you guys want to hear how my War Three meeting went? Oh, that's yes. right. I left. You were just about oh, to have then, that when I left. War Three meeting. How did then it go? We need to decide how you want to proceed. So, um, basically, went through the presentation for uh, there were maybe fifteen people there. This is like the one we did the okay. Um, well, it was a specific this, Ward Three meeting, yeah, okay. and they wanted to get down into more details of the zoning. So I did that, um, and. You know, the, there was one concern about, uh, I think the biggest, the longest discussion was about a particular block of lots that might potentially have the most um, development as a result of any changes that would happen in the URC district. Where's that? Off of Henry Street, because there's some deep lots back there that back up to the dike. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but really I think the issues come down to design because the real concern was what's it going to look like mm -hmm. and if you add 10 units that means 20 parking spaces what is that parking going to look like and how can you make that um, 
not ruin the character of the neighborhood and there's not a 20 space parking lot in that neighborhood so I guess what um, so what, so I think and I think in each of these there's been a lot of question about design what is what are these new potential buildings going to look like and so you know in the interim I've gone through and taken pictures of and, and I think for the most part, Ward 3 was concerned about not design of single-family homes, but design of townhouse units or, um, you know, add-ons to bigger structures. So in the, so we've been sort of thinking at a staff level mm -hmm. about how to get a little bit more detail on design and also include parking areas, because I think that is important. And so if you have, you know, um, dictate how you would create parking for house lots instead of creating a big field of parking in front of a building like on Hockenham Road with mm -hmm. that city view how do you break it up into either small nodes that are then fully landscaped and, and make it sort of a meandering kind of thing if that's possible or alternatively make it look like like you have maybe you have a long driveway with parallel parking along the side so it's not one big space but looks more like a road potentially a narrow an alley or something like that mm -hmm. so um, that's one thing and then the other thing is just sort of I've been taking pictures of examples of probably not such good townhouse development um, at least in terms of character and fitting in the neighborhoods in, in trying to think about putting together more of a graphic design guideline where it's do something like this as opposed to this but have also have other details um, that might be important and then the other thing we've kicked around is wondering if maybe we should hire an architect to s put together sort of uh, a draft set of proposals based on all these ideas about sort of what's good and bad, what might be character defining in Northampton versus, you know, right. Palm Beach or something. Like design guideline-y type of things? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but not, not a whole lot. I mean, just basic premise, you know. Mm -hmm. well, are there any anywhere else besides Village Hill? Yeah, so then I pulled some of those. The only other place is really we have central business, which doesn't really deal with so much residential character. And then there's Elm Street, right. historic, historic district. But if that's based on historic district. Well, didn't we do some on King Street, too? Didn't King we Street do, but they're more for commercial. Oh, so development. this is this is pretty revolutionary. Oh. Yeah, there's no. apply to other, other wards, precincts, or whatever. Right. What a, uh, how does that, the, the place we approved next to the railroad, the townhouses, it's right next City to City View. Uh, off of Holyoke yeah. Street. Yeah. Where does that come in your scale of acceptability? Not this. <laughs> it's what? Not this. Oh, okay. I mean, and I think the issue is a lot of it is parking right in front of the buildings. It's right. not, and, but if you also look at, you know, and I, I remember the planning board had this discussion, how do you, how do you make it look like it's a house when you're facing the street? And I remember Ken Jodry pushing that um, very issue of that end unit and that we and the board m required that the porch be wrapped around to the front so that there was some kind and then I think a window is on that side actually I took pictures of it um, but there are other aspects of it that really you know there's no dimension to the windows there's no roof overhang there's very the, the proportions of the porch to the house just aren't exactly right <laughs> Um, so besides the parking, there are those other aspects. So I think we do need to get into some detail about um, about dimensions. But at the same time, I think it's important not to preclude the ability for someone to incorporate some of those type of characteristics, but not just try to replicate a historic house, but think about some modern kind of construction. Um, yeah, that seems. That seems difficult. Difficult to from define without getting so specific that you're you're dictating what the design is going to be. Yeah, and and I think we'll get pushback too if it's too yeah. restrictive or right. too pro, um, prescriptive. I guess. I should say. But it does. I think it's <coughs> a, a lot of the concerns, right? To do something like that to yeah. get some control over that. Yeah. We did it for Hospital Hill. I mean, I didn't, but somebody. Did. Right. And I think sort of looking at, so now we have those buildings, uh, we have some buildings in place to look at to say, okay, the design standards didn't say build it like that, but it was the foundation for why mm -hmm. there are buildings that are so well designed up there. Yeah, yeah. And, um, 
you know, and there's some more modern looking buildings, but they're take they've taken elements of, you know, sort of more traditional Northampton style mm -hmm. housing. So, so I guess the question is, since there's probably not time tonight to go through <laughs> all of that and sort of think about it, do you want, in terms of timing, if if we can get something about, I assume I well first. Does it make sense to have design be a component before it gets introduced to council? Or more detailed design? Because there's already a little bit of design, but you want us to delve into it more deeply um, and then come back to you guys before you formally introduce it to council. And I'm not th saying take six months. Um, I mean, Wayne and I sort of have to talk more about his concept of potentially hiring someone because I think that'll drag it out a little bit longer right. and I feel like we sort of need to keep the momentum going on this one um, but it's gonna be hard to introduce it to City Council knowing there's opposition right. and knowing you've had a meeting with those guys in Ward 3 right right and no response and yeah right. and, and for us to move it forward it seems right. a little bit genuous right. I mean, yeah. what I would like to do is have something to be introduced to council by the end of the calendar year so that at least it can start the formal public hearing process but I don't know if you guys feel like that's too fast or if well, you want to wait. I mean you could probably I mean for for people who haven't seen them maybe if it what, what's the next meeting like the eighth yeah. do we have a big yeah. schedule is that um no I mean because we, just have, we have them one. for King no, Street oh. we have them for Village Hill we have them for Elm it'd be, it'd be <laughs> you know it might be helpful people just to see what what you're talking about because I know that once for King Street you know it's not like you get down to the colors and right. things like that I mean design guidelines can can mean a lot of things to a lot of people okay. and um, you know they're 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 guy I always think of uh, that Johnny Depp pirate movie their guidelines they're more like they're not rules they're <laughs> how have you been talking about design you know, what's guidelines? Pirates of the Caribbean the Pirates Code well they're more like guidelines <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's not I don't see how anything can happen really fast unless you do hire somebody to do it well, and, and then actually, let me just add one other thing. The other piece of it that came up is instead of um, the other idea was maybe a special permit <coughs> or not allowing more than five units or something in a, on a lot. And so you're probably you'll probably hear that again. Um, and I know that Councillor Freeman Daniels sort of picked up on that idea and thought, well, what? Why couldn't we say special permit for anything more than five units? And I guess my argument against that would be if in the urban residential C we want to allow a mix and variety of units, what would be the point at which during a special permit hearing you would say, no, no. these six units don't work, we're going to say no. So I think, so I just throw that out there, maybe, maybe we could craft language that says here under circumstances you will not get your <coughs> permit. But or as opposed to just saying it doesn't really matter the number of units what matters is how you place it on your site and if it doesn't work on your site that's a reason to say no as opposed to saying at seven units it's bad but at six it's not it's right. not the number of units it's the number of cars well have, and didn't you just Partly. I mean you pretty much just said what the de definition of a site plan is I mean, mm -hmm. to, I mean it's 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 how you lay out the site I mean right right by saying you can't do more than five units on a lot in in URC means what? No clusters? No. I mean, right. Right. That, that I think, I think it'd be oh, it's a wrong way to go is to say no matter no, what no you do, clusters. you can only put in five units. I yeah. don't think that's. A yeah. I agree, but then if you say, but if you can meet all the technical components of setbacks and everything can fit, and you've got parking and so forth, then on top of that, you're going to dictate what it's going to look like, what the roof overhang is going to be, and and so forth. Are you overstepping? Boundaries because we don't have anything like that other than mm -hmm. commercial or you know, Village Hill to me is that that's its own entity. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, I, that's just we don't have anything like that. I'm a little leery of taking one public hearing and suddenly starting to write ordinances based <coughs> on that one public hearing. I've been through a lot of public hearings and they can get sort of stampeded by one or two vocal people and. I think we need to hear more sides to that. We're going to hear from the people that might develop the property and so on. Right, I, and that's a good point. I mean, 15 people at one meeting, <coughs> URC is a pretty big area with a lot of people living in it. So, but I, I think the concern is a is a general concern of you know, 
where the car is going to go, what does that mean, what's it going to look like? Well, but I, and I'm just speaking from my own point of view, and I've got a, you know, five years worth of Dwell magazine sitting at home. But you know, it's I would, I I like the eclectic little house, so I'm I'm resistant to residential design standards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you, you recognize what you don't want usually. I know that's what happens, but if somebody you know can't build a really high quality but unusual house, I think that's a shame. Right. No, I, I, I definitely agree with that. I mean, this isn't, I've said this before, this isn't Nantucket, you know, <laughs> you know or Old Deerfield. I mean, there's, you know, people need to... Well, I think that's also might be why we should see what design guidelines mean, because, you know, Marblehead design guidelines, you know, you can't paint your house a certain color because of what they say, but I think what we're talking about doesn't necessarily mean anything nearly to that level of detail. So... I, I'm not, I don't rule them out because I, you know, I've seen them that they can be general enough. Um, I mean, what I, the other thing is we can I can get some examples. I mean, we have we've collected pictures over the years since Sustainable Northampton of sort of small lot infill housing that is meant to fit in, but is sort of a modern kick to it for different neighborhoods. So what I can do is go back to those standards that generated those designs and see what they look like. I mean, from other communities, not Northampton. Um, because I think, and, you know, we can take a look at pictures from Northampton of things that, you know, maybe what I think doesn't work, you guys are perfectly fine with it. You don't think that, you know, that would be over. That's why I think it would get tricky. Like, you know, you know that modern house on Woodlawn Avenue? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm where some people might hate that, some people might love it, but it's different. But I wouldn't want, if our mindset is uh, is trying to build design guidelines around uh, a four unit townhouse from going up and it has to meet certain design guidelines, guidelines and so forth, and because of that, we affect an open lot that has nothing to do with what we were headed towards, but restricts somebody from building what they really wanted to build and forces them to build a house that looks like every other house where they don't want to do that, then I think we're getting way off into an area well, we don't want to get to. I mean, the, the Ward Avenue house, I was just thinking about that because I think it's one of the most incredible houses in the state, let alone in Massachusetts, let alone on Ward Avenue. And there certainly don't. Generates work. discussion, I know that, but which I think is good. I just, I mean, I don't know, maybe I don't have a great read on this, but I feel like this could fail. Um, and so do we want to be proactive about ways to make it stronger as it goes to City Council? I mean, I don't know. I could be totally wrong about it, but I just wasn't getting... I'm, I'm nervous about it. Just the rezoning in general. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you're wrong about it. On the other hand, though, I mean... Uh, I'm not, I mean, I'm not saying that this is the answer, but... Yeah, are we I just hate to something? cobble something together. Okay, this group of people wants design standards, so right. if you are CA, you get design. This this group of people wants. Right. No, uh, I know. And, How do you address and, enough concerns to? Yeah, and you can drive around URC, and if we come up with design standards, you're going to come up. You can find hundreds of houses probably in URC that aren't going to meet them. Right. But then, are we just re are resigning ourselves to this failing at City Council? Uh, but the but the issue at least that would make me lead to perhaps support your idea that it might fail is that somehow there's this perception that it is going to dramatically change mm -hmm. the face of this entire town. Right. Which does not seem to really be realistic, but that is clearly, I think, what is causing the groundswell right. of that somehow it is going to yeah. dramatically right. change, you know, right. overnight. Right. And yet, it's going to come in and... Right. Little, and that all of a sudden, you know, right. you know there won't be a spare piece of grass, whatever. Right. I think anyway. even though, I mean, I think Carolyn's presentation spoke to that very issue. Yeah. I don't, people that didn't want to hear it didn't right. hear it. Yeah. So I think they'll be at City Council saying exactly that. The hearing I went to, uh, the word that everyone was repeating was massive, mm -hmm. massive change. This is going to be massive changes to the city. Um, it's going to lower my property values too. Right. And, the, and then the whole traffic. Uh, concern. So I don't know. I don't think. I think maybe from the 15 people at the ward uh, three meeting, design. But I didn't really hear design from from the other 
other citizens. I don't know. I well, then, and I don't know if you were at the, I can't remember when I showed the, I did the map with the percentages. It was the second the one. Meeting. Did you go to that? No. Oh, okay. No, but you didn't have it at the first meeting. And then I think. I didn't have the percentages for the second meeting. Oh, okay. I had it for another plan. I think it was for a plan. Yeah. 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 Y